As we begin this module in endurance, I'll, I'll note that this is a relatively short one. Uh, again, we're going to follow the NSCA kind of version of this, and um, there's a lot of different ideas on how to train for endurance type events and different things, um, but uh, mainly we're, we'll, we'll focus on kind of how they uh, um, approach it. Um, so uh, we're going to split this into two, two parts. The first is kind of the basic physiology under, and underlying endurance principles, and then we'll get into um, some of the training. So when you think about endurance training, I think uh, at least me as, as a person, and, and I would suspect if you ask um, a lot of people who maybe don't compete in endurance events, but you know have some general understanding of the physiology and exercise physiology, they would say that endurance performance is uh, really related to uh, VO2 max. And what we mean by VO2 max, just to kind of get everyone on the, on the same page, is, is the measurement of oxygen consumption. And this is, this is based on kind of the idea that uh, we take, grab my pen here, um, that we you know, take the food that we eat, food that we eat, we then break it down into you know, some type of carbon fat, That gets into our bloodstream and then goes into our terribly drawn skeletal muscle. Right? The other idea is that we use oxygen as part of oxidative metabolism. This is used in conjunction with this to make ATP, which we can, we can then use to form muscle contractions. So in this very simplistic view of, of kind of metabolism and the way that, that this works is ultimately oxygen acts as the final electron acceptor. So um, oxygen is combined with hydrogen molecules to ultimately form H2O. So what we can do is, you know, in the lab, hook someone up to uh, a machine that's monitoring both um, oxygen that's being breathed in. We know that that's room air and, and then can monitor the amount of oxygen that then is expired and ultimately the difference between inspired and expires tell us how much was consumed during um, this oxidative metabolism. Right? So that's our VO2 and then our maximal value of that is then you know the uh, maximal ability to uh, essentially we can think about it as our uh, maximal ability to make ATP. Right? And in theory, the more ATP you can make, the more muscle contractions you can do. The more muscle contractions you can do, the better your endurance performance is. At least in theory that way. And indeed, if we, if we look at a lot of uh, endurance trained people, uh, really well trained people, you'll see that most of them have really high VO2 maxes. And so here's um, you know, a, a general list of of um, kind of well-established VO2 max that were you know tested in the lab, so you know anywhere from 85. I'll note that you know there's there's been some reports of you know mid to upper 90s in in, in certain uh, people, uh, uh, in particular cross-country skiers uh, seem to have a, a large amount uh, of uh, or a large VO2 max. Um, but but I think we can kind of pick out a pattern here that you know most of these are are relatively high. To give you a a relative uh, value. So most college-aged uh, 20 to 25-year-old uh, males uh, usually hover in the mid-40s uh, for kind of untrained, and then as you age, it, it goes down. So um, as you can see, these are, are relatively high values. Um, again, 85, really high. Uh, anything above and beyond that. I've actually measured a couple people who uh, were in the 70s um, to kind of give you an idea of, of, of what that is. They were, they were both cross-country runners that, that I've uh, been able to to, to see 70s. Um, um, so again, that idea that endurance trained individuals, as we look at these, you know, 10,000 uh, marathon runners, uh, um, 100 kilometer runners, uh, di different, you know, long distance endurance type events. In general, these people are training and they're having high VO2 max values. But another thing I think that we can kind of point out here um, is that, you know, here is you know, someone who set the um, marathon world record uh, in, in 1969, and, and their VO2 max, not really that great. Um, indeed, I, I, like, like I said, I've uh, measured two people in the 70s. I can guarantee you they would 
be nowhere close to setting the marathon record uh, with this low VO2. So that, I think that's a, the, an interesting point to make uh, is that VO2 max, while yes, when you're endurance training, you improve VO2 max, but what we can say now is that maximal oxygen consumption is not the true determinant of, um, of a, uh, athletic success. Right, so just because you have the highest VO2 does not mean that you're going to be the fastest 5, 10 k -er, uh, 25 k -er, or marathon, et cetera, et cetera. Right, so what is it? Um, ultimately, if we kind of uh, look at this, this is a, a little bit of a, a convoluted um, graph, but what, what we can see here is let's focus on person A here first. So this person has a, a, re, um, a, a very high VO2 max, again, about 71, 72. But you'll see that what happens is their VO2 max occurs at roughly 20 miles per hour. Uh, we'll say that this is on the treadmill. Right? If we look at person B and C, what you'll see is that their VO2 max um, actually occurs at a later point. So yes, even though their VO2 max here is 68, is less than our VO2 max of 72 here, you'll see that this person's VO2 max occurred at a running speed which was actually faster than that of person A. Um, sorry, this is uh, person C, so VO2 max. So here um, you can see that person B, their running economy was roughly the same. So their VO2 max occurred at a running velocity of about 20 miles an hour. Right. So if we were to, to, to line these up in a competition, right, we would say that A is, is going to, in theory, be B. But who would be who would win out of all of them? They would be C. Again, this idea that their peak velocity occurred, that their VO2 max occurred at a faster peak velocity. So in theory, they were running at about 22 and a half miles an hour. Okay. So what this uh, ultimately comes out to is the idea that it's not about our maximal oxygen consumption, but about the economy or the efficiency in which we're running, right? And this economy uh, is uh, due to several different things. There's a, a handful of, of different projections of what it could be. There's uh, ideas that it could be cardiovascular related, so actually coronary blood flow. Uh, there's um, ideas about actual running uh, economy in itself, so making sure you're having proper foot uh, um, strikes and uh, economy in the arms and legs and movements and, and really making that efficient as well as kind of uh, some biomechanical aspects of looking at uh, muscle stiffness and tendon stiffness and uh, the ability to kind of transmit again those forces in a in a physics uh, standpoint. I'm not going to go into those theories but just letting you know that that, that could be some some extra reading that is uh, you know pretty uh, interesting stuff to go into you know why they think this is but like I said ultimately it's the idea of who can uh, you know best utilize the amount of oxygen that they're consuming right so if you're able to uh, run um, uh, at the same speed but use less ATP then of course you're not going to fatigue nearly as fast and indeed if we look at that that's kind of what we um, can see here so really we're, we're just going to focus on uh, the dark bars I, the light bars are, are interesting so these are middle distance guys um, for, for non-track folks middle distance uh, is what I would consider long distance, so milers, uh, two milers uh, in, in that genre, uh, and long distance is the, the much longer, so 5k or, or greater, um, but um, I'll note a couple things, so one, if we, if we look at percent intensity, so how high are they running uh, as it relates to their uh, VO2 max, so uh, one thing I'll, I'll just note about these middle distance guys, it's not uncommon for those guys running the mile to actually be running uh, greater uh, than uh, uh, about 5% more than their VO2 max, which is um, kind of crazy. But um, anyway, so that, that tells you why uh, these long distance runners, so these 5 and 10 Kers, aren't able to drop down and run the mile um, and win them, that, that there is a, a, special, a special kind of in-between phase. Again, we're going to stick with the, the long distance runners. Uh, and, and what I want to point out here is, is this, is that these guys are running at really high power outputs. So these people are running at about 90% uh, of their VO2 max for an entire race. So for example, uh, these people are running marathons, so 26.2 miles at roughly 90% of their maximal power output. Uh, to me, that's just kind of mind-blowing.
right? But again, it's the idea that the faster you can go, um, i.e. the highest power output you can before fatigue is the most important part of this race. So, you know, the difference isn't if this person has a VO2 max of 75 versus 70, it's can I run at 85% of my VO2 max or can I run at 92% of my VO2 max? If I can run at 90%, 92%, I'm more economical, more efficient, therefore I'm going to have a better race. So I think that's really the important part of understanding this is, yes, it's important to train um, our VO2 max. Without that, you can't compete. And indeed, uh, most people would say, I think uh, kind of the, the general thought is a, a VO2 max greater than, than about 68 uh, mils per kg per minute is considered elite. So what most people would say is, if you have a VO2 max below 68, you're not going to be able to compete in these you know, high level races. If you have above 68, then you can compete and that's when it then comes down to this economy and efficiency, right? And again, if we think about this, this is how close can we run to fatiguing? So what I'll get into next is what is then a good marker then? If it's not VO2 max, if we're not trying to get out there and make everyone have VO2 maxes of 90 in our training, what are we trying to train in order to improve this fatigability resistance. So this is um, a very classic paper by Peter Farrell, um, who, um, who's a prominent scientist now at, at Penn State. He uh, worked in the lab of, of Dave Costell, who's kind of the, um, the father of at least VO2 max testing and exercise performance. And he did this in his lab at, at Ball State. Uh, kind of showing uh, uh, a bunch of regression analysis on, on what it what actually most related to um, marathon velocity or, or which is a, another way to think about how long it took them to complete the marathon. So uh, what they actually came up with was this idea of velocity at anaerobic threshold. So you may be familiar with that, but what we're really going to get to is this is the lactate threshold. So what you can see is I mean, just an incredibly beautiful linear relationship, right? That as your lactate threshold increases, so the person with the highest lactate threshold was able to run the marathon the fastest or maintain the fastest speed, right? So if you had an increased lactate threshold, then you had a higher um, velocity during the marathon. And of course, the higher the velocity, the faster you run, the, fa the better chance you have um, of winning, right? So, uh, that really becomes the ultimate, you know, kind of way to look at this is that we want to kind of improve lactate threshold and a lot of the training is going to kind of have this as, as, a, as a backdrop. So um, with that, let me get into lactate threshold a little bit because I would say uh, when I kind of read through um, papers or textbooks or whatever, this is one of those topics that just gets thrown all over the place. And so I, I like to kind of break it down to some of the basics. So uh, let's talk uh, more specifically what lactate threshold is and what it means. So first, this is the classic physiologist in me. Uh, if you're curious about lactic acid or lactate, what's the difference? So lactic acid is actually what's produced via anaerobic glycolysis. Uh, most people use them, including myself, interchangeably, but technically they're different. Lactic acid is, of course, um, what's produced. So this is our end product of glycolysis. So if you'll remember, pyruvate gets converted into lactic acid, and dude, this is pyruvic acid to be um, specific. So lactic acid is actually produced. However, since the pH in our body is slightly basic, uh, we hover around 7.4 with 7 being neutral. So since we're slightly basic, uh, this hydrogen um, ion essentially gets kicked off immediately uh, in order to donate it to the basic environment uh, that is buffering this acid. Therefore, we then produce lactate. So ultimately, at a normal pH, lactic acid rapidly dissociates from its lactic acid into lactate so that lactic acid rarely exists in the body. All right, so let's look at uh, a, an example of, of what running speed um, and lactate threshold looks like. So one of the things that I think most people um, talk about is um, lactate threshold is this idea of you fatigue at lactate threshold. So 
I'm going to use a completely different terminology here, um, and this is slightly different than, than kind of NSCA uh, teaches uh, in, in their books and, and materials. So um, I, I just want to make sure I teach it the, the right way, at least as I see it. So if we look, we can look at kind of uh, this graph and we can see three different inflection points. And what I mean by an inflection point is change in slope. So anytime we see a change in slope, then we want to um, kind of mark that as what we call an inflection point. And so um, I've, I've kind of taken the liberty here to kind of draw some straight lines. So we see a relatively flat. So you see resting usually hovers right around one millimolar, right? We can then see that as we increase running speed, uh, the faster you run, again, the idea that lactate starts to build up. And we call this first inflection point here, this is lactate threshold. Right, so when we first start to see a change in slope where these points start to rise above our kind of resting baseline flat value, that's called lactate threshold. Uh, this usually um, occurs again between values of about one and four. And you can see if we kind of roughly draw these here. That there's our lactate threshold. So it's kind of this this nice little range. What then happens is roughly, and this is pretty consistent around most people, is roughly around a blood lactate concentration of four, you'll see that this slope changes dramatically so that we see this huge sharp rise in lactate. What we term that value is actually the onset of blood lactate accumulation, otherwise known as OBLA. So that's point number two. Again, I would say most people uh, somewhat use these interchangeably or a lot of times just use curves where they show one inflection point. Uh, I think it's pretty well established in the lactate um, literature that, that this isn't the case, that just using one inflection point is relatively simplistic, that we actually have two. So we have one small change in slope here where we start to increase and then a second really rapid. So when we start talking about fatigue, this is the point we want to care about not lactate threshold. Again, now you can see why this may be confusing to a lot of people that they hear um, lactate threshold is causing fatigue, but realistically our point is the onset of blood lactate accumulation. That's the point we're most interested in. So again, we can look at this graph in the exact same thing. So lactate threshold hovering around one, between one and four. We see another change in slope here, uh, roughly around four where we get this rapid rise. Here's our fatigue. All right, so what is um, then the cause of this? So um, I'll just run through a, a couple things. So here, um, again, this bottom curve, this is our lactate curve. Again, relatively flat, sharp, uh, slight increase in slope, and then rapid increase. So here's our lactate threshold. Here's our OBLA, just like that. If we kind of draw the same um, points here, what we can see is this RA, which stands for the rate of appearance and our RD, which stands for our rate of disappearance. So we got white lettering, I, I, I apologize. Um, it should be black, but what we can do is, is then kind of draw these lines. If we, if we kind of uh, draw rough lines down the middle here, we, we start to see a lot of color. Um, let me switch into something that I don't have on the screen. So again, if, if we Kind of draw this. What we can say is lactate threshold here is due to, we can see that there's a change in slope here. So lactate threshold is due to a change in appearance. So we get increased appearance, no change in disappearance. However, if we look, we see disappearance changes here. So right in the middle, you can see it's roughly idea that OBLA is due to an increase in appearance and a decrease in clearance or disappearance. Okay. And the important thing as we've talked about is that lactate threshold is indeed trainable. So this is uh, kind of looking at blood lactate curves over uh, several years of, of a middle distance runner who was uh, you know, uh, undergoing kind of your, your classic endurance training and this idea that you know as their first season as they kind of come in here's their lactate threshold. Again we could probably draw three slopes here. Right, um, so our OBLA is right here. So what we would say is this person could run 
roughly their first year about a little less than 16 miles per hour. Uh, I'm going to keep it you know simple and not draw tons but you know here I would say is kind of the second change in slope or, or maybe right here we'll go with right here so when we see a rapid change so their junior year they could run roughly 17 and a half miles an hour uh, before fatiguing and then season three um, is, is even better so what you see is again gradual shifts to the right in this lactate threshold suggesting that uh, you must work at a higher intensity in order to get um, lactate uh, threshold in order to reach lactate threshold um, and again this is kind of fatigue and here's a, a nice little another example here's a, a swimmer uh, looking at this and this is the idea here is that you know if you're trying to swim what which one would you uh, which speed would you pick? So here's you know the person completing uh, this kind of 30 minute time trial at different speeds. So 1.26, 1.28, 1.3. If we look, here's our lactate concentrations. Again, we do get um, a rise in this. Um, so so we see that they kind of rise and they plateau. What you'll see is once they get above this four, which is marked here in green, um, once they get above that, you'll see that this person. Um, actually fatigues, right? So at 1.34 miles an hour, they are actually unable to complete the 30-minute time trial. If they go even faster, of course, they only last 15 minutes, right? So the idea is that you want to um, actually, uh, you know, race as close up into this onset of blood lactate accumulation. And again, here's, you know, just kind of my, my personal preference. Everyone says you want to work up until your lactate threshold, and that's where you want to work. Realistically, as the way I teach it, lactate threshold occurs much earlier. Um, and so you want to work right up until your value of onset of blood lactate accumulation. Again, right up until about where it equals four. And so I think that's kind of the important uh, kind of takeaways that we ultimately want to train this lactate threshold. The one thing that I'll leave is that uh, while this is really great, so we, we have this beautiful uh, system and beautiful setup that we say once you reach the onset of blood lactate accumulation, or OBLA, that you then fatigue. And therefore, uh, we can say, is this a cause and effect type relationship, right? If you get above four, then the effect is that you are unable to prevent it. Well, indeed, this was thought for a really long time that... Um, that this was a driving factor in fatigue. And uh, I won't get too in depth, but I'll just say that indeed this is actually not the case. We, we don't think this is the case at all. Indeed, uh, the overall consensus of lactate has shifted all over the place. So at once it was thought to have just been a complete waste metabolic product. So you produced lactic acid, converted it to lactate, and then it was just gone and completely worthless and you couldn't use that molecule uh, for uh, aerobic metabolism. Uh, well, you know, that ended up not panning out. Uh, and so we then learned that you could actually easily convert lactate back into pyruvate, use it then uh, into the Krebs cycle, TCA cycle, and then through the electron transport chain and get all that energy through aerobic metabolism, just as you would a pyruvate molecule. Uh, there was also, of course, that bout where uh, it, it somehow made it into the literature that lactic acid or lactate buildup caused muscle damage, and so it was really bad, and so you needed to do things like flush out the muscle system um, in order to get the lactic acid out so that you wouldn't uh, cause muscle damage and, and get sore and cause delayed onset muscle soreness, uh, which ultimately decreases force production. Uh, and of course we know that that's not true, delayed onset muscle soreness is completely unrelated to lactate uh, production and it is only related to uh, delayed onset muscle soreness is related to micro tears in the muscle. Um, and uh, so now we're kind of at this, well, lactate is, is still bad, so can we do things to prevent it? So can we, you know, take bicarbonate or can we do, you know, these weird uh, dosing regimens to kind of prevent lactic acid formation so that we can prevent fatigue and um, I think we're st slowly starting to learn that, that that may not be the case either. So it's it's not even that lactic acid is causing fatigue. In, in fact, if you actually look at some of the um, some new data and looking at like oxyhemoglobin curves and different things like that, we we can actually get a picture that maybe lactic acid actually improves performance 
at least uh, as you kind of work up to it. So if we're, we're working here at this graph at, at 1.33 meters per second, and we do have an increase in lactate, that this increase in lactate is actually beneficial. We're using it for good things um, as a signaling molecule and, and not bad things. So uh, I, I think the consensus now is that lactate isn't a cause of fatigue. And, and I completely agree with that. So lactate doesn't cause fatigue. However, it's still a phenomenal marker of fatigue. And that's still why it, it's so important is because even though it's not a cause and effect relationship, it is still a beautiful effect that when lactic acid reaches that point of OBLA, you're going to start to fatigue and see performance decrements. So again, the idea is we can still work there. It's just not a cause and effect. So with that, uh, we'll kind of close up some of the physiology and then we'll get into some of the training in the next video.